Hello, and welcome to the Current Science and Technology Podcast from the Museum of Science in Boston. I'm your host, Susan Heilman, and every week we bring you interviews with guest researchers and our museum staff covering science and technology in depth. Today you'll hear from the museum's nanotechnology correspondent, Corrine Tate, as she talks to Brian Bergstein from MIT's Technology Review about some of their choices for the top 10 emerging technologies of 2012. How do we know which technologies will have a big impact? Which ones might change our lives? Today we have an expert here to share his insight. I have with me Brian Bergstein, Deputy Editor at MIT's Technology Review Magazine. He's here to share with us their selections for the top 10 emerging technologies of the last year. Thanks for joining me today, Brian. Thanks for having me. So we're talking about technologies here, and some of our listeners, when they hear that word, they think of their cell phones and laptops and electronics in general. But your top 10 list encompasses much more than that. How do you define technology? Right. We look for things that are going to have a broad impact on society across a bunch of different fields. We're not just looking at electronics and the web and IT and what people kind of think of as consumer technology. We're looking for technologies that will have a broad impact on society. So that can be something in energy. It can be biomedicine, even new materials. And a lot of these technologies will interact with each other. So there's a lot of materials breakthroughs, for example, that will have an impact in energy or in medicine. And there'll be computing breakthroughs that have impact in medicine and so on. So we think of the, each of these categories as somewhat foundational and able to affect a wide swath of investment and uh, what people are focusing on. So it could be in a wide variety of fields, but how do you make the selection of the top 10? What criteria do you take into account? Right. So this is actually something that provokes a lot of controversy among our readers. We hear about the TR10 in great detail. We'll get sort of angry letters. How could you have picked this? And I think maybe one misconception is that we're picking the 10 most innovative breakthroughs or the things that themselves required the 10 hardest problems to solve. But what we're looking for is a cross-section of technologies so that they're not necessarily comparable. So, for example, one of our top 10 technologies of the year was Facebook's timeline, which a lot of our users disagreed with. And I can explain and defend in detail. There's no way that is as innovative as a new uh, kind of solar cell that's highly efficient. It's not even comparable. The way you solve those problems or what each thing is meant to do is completely different. But we're hoping to highlight 10 big problems in the world that need solving, 10 issues that are drawing a lot of energy, resources, and by that I mean what are are engineers focused on trying to solve? What problems are they trying to solve? What solutions are they trying to create? So we start essentially with what are problems in the world that people are trying to solve, and our top 10 technologies are not necessarily the 10 best solutions to these problems, but they give us a window into some of the world's pressing problems that technology can eventually solve. Whether these particular technologies are the ones is sort of another question. I see. But you mentioned Facebook's timeline, for example. Exactly what problem is that addressing? It is not necessarily addressing a problem on its face that seems civilizational in scale, But when you look at it another way, it kind of is. So basically, Facebook's timeline is just a reorganization of people's personal profile pages on the site. And what is new about it is that it sort of broke the paradigm of everything kind of falling in a a steady stream that basically bubbled up only the most recent stuff to the top. The, The idea behind the timeline is to expose far more of your activity on the site into something that you will see more often. So for Facebook, this has the benefit of making you more likely to update older material, revisit older material, stay on the site longer, give them more information. That's not exactly what we care about here. That's sort of Facebook's business issue. But what struck us as interesting about it is it's a recognition that the amount of information that we are now posting to Facebook and that's a proxy for how much information about us in general there is on the web, is so large and so vast it's requiring new methods of visualization. And whether the timeline in itself is going to be a model followed by other sites, it doesn't matter. What we're, what we're really interested in is here's 
probably one of the biggest data companies of all when you look at how much data Facebook actually has. Here's how they, they came up with this new way to organize your information. And it's a recognition that we need better ways to visualize information and to make things that we're storing on the web more intuitive. And so the problem I say it's solving is essentially the question of information overload. So what you're saying is Facebook's timeline is not really about the user experience as much as organizing user data in a better way. Yeah, that's right. And that is a fundamental problem lots of organizations are going to have. That actually leads me to another technology I wanted to talk about. If we're talking about dealing with huge amounts of data, another place we have huge amounts of data is our genome. And one of your technologies was nanopore DNA sequencing. Now, I thought that was a little odd because I thought we can already sequence DNA. So why is this technology on the list? Right. So the idea that we can sequence DNA is becoming pretty commonplace. But what's going to take us to another phase and really accelerate the use of this technology is the ability to sequence being easier, faster, and, of course, less expensive. Well, what is it like now? The ability to sequence DNA varies widely in price. It depends what you're doing. It depends if you're just sort of sequencing the DNA of uh, a cancer tumor or whether you want to sequence someone's whole genome. But it's been falling in price for years, and we're headed towards the ability to sequence a, a human genome for a few thousand dollars. You'll hear some talk about a $1,000 genome, but often DNA has to be sequenced multiple times to make sure you get an accurate readout. There's various things you have to do that raise the cost beyond that sort of easy conversational number of $1,000. But there is this company in the UK, Oxford Nanopore, that has come up with a very efficient way of sequencing DNA. And basically, it uses this, this tiny pore in a device. The device is, so, is small enough that the device itself can be plugged into a computer through a USB port. The price could be around $1,000. They're saying around 900 to sequence human DNA. Now, again, it will depend what you're using it for. To sequence someone's entire genome, all 3 billion base pairs, is a different story. But the technology is powerful enough that you can get accurate readouts pretty quickly. And, and the reason we think this is important is that if you can do targeted sequencing quickly, and in more places, you're going to expand the use of the technology. So again, it's sort of transformative in that DNA sequencing happens in this sort of specialized lab environment. But what if eventually food inspectors could go to a, a plant and instantly sequence whether some sample is infected with E. coli you know, by, by looking for the E. coli genome? That's the kind of thing that becomes possible when the technology becomes much, much cheaper. Oh, wow. That's something that I, I wouldn't have thought would be necessary, DNA sequencing for something like uh, food inspection. I was always thinking of it more in terms of uh, medical applications and possibly leading to personalized medicine. So the idea is this device is much smaller and simpler than the lab techniques right now that we use to sequence DNA. How is it doing that? What's really cool about this device is that it is actually getting an electronic signal from the DNA. As a strand of DNA passes through this little pore, each base will have essentially a different charge, and that's sort of registering an, ele an electric signature that can be read almost instantaneously. Well, that does sound pretty simple. So it's just pulling a single strand of DNA through a tiny hole and measuring the differences in the electric current? More or less, that's right. That's right. It's very ingenious, actually. That seems like it'll have a lot of potential impact, both in medicine and, as you mentioned, a lot of other fields that might need to identify foreign DNA. So on your list, I saw a few different technologies related to energy. Uh, you already mentioned at the beginning um, super efficient solar panels. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Right. So one of the technology breakthroughs of the year was a solar cell from a company called Semprius, which is based in North Carolina. And it achieved a record efficiency for converting sunlight into electricity. We wanted to be careful with this because solar efficiency records are a little bit like swimming records and in that there's hundreds of them. You know, like there's the 100 meter, the 200 meter, and the freestyle. <laughs> Something similar happens in solar because it depends, are you measuring with silicon? Are you measuring with gallium arsenide? And so on, right? And so Semprius uses a very expensive 
a material called gallium arsenide, which has been known for a long time to be more efficient at converting light to electricity than silicon. So silicon is what most people are using now, or? Silicon is what is the standard now. It's abundant. It's relatively cheap. Gallium arsenide is more expensive. What is the efficiency of silicon solar panels? Well, so it's a tough thing to compare. It's not always sort of apples to apples because solar panel efficiency varies widely depending on the material used and some other techniques, which I can get into in a bit. Broadly speaking, the best efficiency for solar panels is around 23%. Again, that there's some nuance to that. But Semprius's panels were about 34% in, in these sort of ideal conditions. That's a really big jump. It is, but the, the, the catch again is that so they're using gallium arsenide, which is a more expensive material, and it also requires these tiny lenses that concentrate the light. So this has been done before, but uh, Semprius has a sort of a novel breakthrough. What you do is, if you have a solar cell in it, which is what, there's lots of these solar cells that make up a solar panel. If you put lenses over each one, it concentrates the light and increases the efficiency. More electricity can be made out of the incoming light. So these lenses are basically increasing the amount of the sun's energy that right. we're able to trap. Just think of it as the lenses are focusing the light more finely onto the cell, right? So that's been done for a long time, but it, it creates a lot of heat. And what Semprius has done is they made their cells tiny. And when you now have these tiny lenses over them to focus them, you have small amounts of heat in each instance. So you imagine a lot more of these cells, each one very small, but the amount of heat building up on each cell is smaller, and you don't need this expensive cooling system to route the heat away. Okay, so you can concentrate more of the light without having the drawbacks of the extra heat and exactly. needing to get rid of that. So basically you get more efficiency without dramatically raising the cost. And another, another way of thinking about it is you overcome the cost disadvantage of gallium arsenide that way. So you use very small amounts of the material in each instance and you're essentially getting more bang for your buck spread over the whole panel. Are they getting efficiencies where solar cells might now be able to compete with our other energy sources? So that's a great question. So I think the answer is the, the jury, so to speak, on Semprius and economics is sort of still out because when you have to concentrate the sunlight in order to get these maximal efficiencies, that makes the panels work best only under ideal circumstances. So this is not for a rooftop solar installation it's made for large utility scale projects in the southwest where the sun is more intense and more uh, reliable. So that limits the sort of instances in which you could use the Semprius technology. The company claims that they are close, though, with manufacturing scale to get the panels that will be made with their technology able to produce power at sort of grid parity or even below it, meaning it would be competitive. Again, it would only be competitive in certain places, but even that is a huge slice of the world, right, where you could say in this belt of the United States alone, for example, you know, you could do solar power roughly on par for traditional electricity. That does sound like a really big improvement, just improving the efficiency of solar so now it does become cost competitive with other energy sources. That really sounds like something transformative. Yeah, it could be. The big challenge will be whether they can ramp up their manufacturing enough to get the economies of scale that bring the price down. Well, thank you, Brian. Uh, That's basically all the time we have to cover in today's podcast. Where can listeners go to find out about the rest of the technologies you picked for your top 10 list? Yeah, Kareen, they should go to www.technologyreview.com slash TR10. Thank you so much for sharing these fascinating and exciting technologies that will most certainly have a big impact on our lives now and in the future. Great. Thanks for having me. That's it for this week's show, but be sure to come back next time for more of the latest in science and technology. This podcast is a production of Current Science and Technology at the Museum of Science in Boston, part of the Boston community for over 175 years. For more information, visit our website at www.mos.org slash CST or email us at podcast at mos.org. Thanks for listening.